five keys to unlocking creativity and why it's good to keep working out at the creativity gym. Imagine an artist sitting in front of her easel, mind focused as she faces a blank canvas and thinks long and hard about where and how she'll make her first mark. Or a games designer hunched over his keyboard, frantically stabbing the keys as he creates the storyboard sketch for a new interactive game to run on smartphones. Or a team of engineers huddled round a simple mock-up of a new product, pulling it into shape, scribbling notes on the flip chart behind them as they gradually refine the idea, giving shape to what will eventually become the baby buggy of the future, but which now looks like the undercarriage of a very old and rather rickety aeroplane. Or a nurse on the night shift, sitting alone at her desk in the hospital ward, quietly taking time to sketch out an idea she's had for a new way to handle the medication trolley, to make sure she and her colleagues don't inadvertently give the wrong dose, or worse, the wrong tablets, to her patients. Or an aid worker, sitting with a group of refugees, talking about the mobile phone app she's hoping to develop to help solve the problem of relocating missing members of a family and helping them reconnect after they've fled a war zone. Now, what's the common thread running through all these stories? Creativity, the ability to come up with novel solutions to problems. The context might vary widely, but the core activity is still the same, creating something useful and valuable from ideas. Now, for our ancestors, creativity was a matter of survival. Not being big, strong or fast meant that if we couldn't think our way out of a problem, like an approaching predator, then we'd not be around for long. Dealing with the daily struggle to survive required us to be innovative. And the key to that was the ability to imagine and explore different possibilities. And it's pretty clear that creativity, that ability to come up with novel solutions to problems, is going to be even more in demand as we approach the future. The word is everywhere. Creative industries, creative people, creative leaders, creative organisations, and so on. But it's not just a fashion label. In a world where we face some pretty tough challenges, it's a truism to say we need all the creativity we can get. Whether we're a solo startup entrepreneur, a member of a team tasked with helping the organisation think outside the box, or someone trying to change the world through social innovation, this creativity stuff is going to be needed. So it's good to know that we already have the most important resource to help deliver it. The one and a half kilos of pinky grey stuff between our ears. It comes as standard equipment with any human being. And our brain, and the amazing ability it has for imagination, is the key. The trouble is that creativity, whilst really important, is also shrouded in myths which cloud our understanding of this key resource. For example, here are five common blocks that restrict our creative ability. For example, here are five common blocks which restrict our creative capability. There's the lone genius myth. Now, creativity isn't a magic gift possessed by a few lucky individuals. Nor is it merely something with which we're endowed at birth, a trait or a characteristic passed on by our genes. There may be predispositions which help, but research is pretty clear. Creativity is something which can be practised, trained and developed by anyone. And it's very much an action, not a state of being. Or there's the blinding flash of inspiration myth. Think of the cartoons and you get the idea. Pew! Light bulb flashes on and there you have it. The eureka moment. But research tells us that creativity is a process. One that starts with a sense of a problem which may take time to take shape. That's followed by a period of incubation where even if we're not consciously working on it, our brains are seeking a solution. 
And then the aha moment when the flash of insight tells us we're onto something. A phase which is followed by a validation, checking out and building around our idea. OK, it's not always that dramatic, but think of the times when you've been wrestling with a problem and eventually you give up on it. Decide to call it a day and get some rest, only to wake up suddenly the next morning with that flash of certainty. Or there's the Big Bang myth. The trouble with such powerful moments of insight is that there's a danger of thinking that the hard work's done. No, no, it's only just starting. To convert our idea into something useful is going to take a lot of shaping and polishing. As Thomas Edison reminds us, creativity is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. His numbers might be challenged, but the underlying message is clear. Powerful ideas take work in refining them. As Andrew Hargaden nicely puts it, breakthrough innovation usually involves a long fuse before that big bang. Or there's the creative personality myth. A close cousin to the lone genius one, this is all about creative style. Research shows that a small number of people are comfortable with regular and dramatic rearrangement of their mental furniture, twisting their minds to embrace impossible new configurations. Most of us are a little more conservative in our approach, and some of us are extremely cautious. It doesn't matter. We're all capable of creativity, but our preferred styles for expressing and exploring it vary. Michael Curtin's extensive research identified a scale running from what he called adapters, those who preferred an incremental step-by-step -step approach, right through to innovators who preferred to make bigger, riskier jumps. And then there's the solo act myth. Now, while we're all capable of creating on our own, the evidence is clear. We're more effective working together. With open-ended problems where there's no right answer, the more minds on the job, the more volume of ideas we're likely to create, but also the more variations on the theme. It's what Joy Guilford called fluency, coming up with more ideas at the volume side and flexibility, coming up with different ideas. And this correlates highly with the number of people involved which is why we have group-based approaches like brainstorming and why crowdsourcing has become such a powerful tool in the innovation box. Working together stimulates us in new and different directions because it builds on our diversity. There's a catch to this one though. Whilst working together is potentially much better, it only works when we have the right balance of group dynamics. And that's not just about being nice and supportive to each other, although psychological safety is really important. But we also need to be comfortable with challenge and conflict, feel able to kick the tires, knock an interesting idea into robust shape. So the good news is we're all creative. That's a great start. Even more important, creativity involves a set of skills which can be trained. Think of it like a set of muscles which regular practice at the gym can tone and strengthen to cope with great challenges. So what do we know about these skills and how might they be developed further? Well, that's the focus of our new book, which reviews the extensive research on creativity and offers, we hope, some practical guidance for how to develop key skills and bring them together to build our creative capability. It's useful to think of three levels, the individual, the group, and the wider context in which they operate. And there are things that we can think about and improve in each of those areas. At the individual level, four key skills seem to play an important role. First, problem exploration. Being prepared to look around the edges, redefine, reframe, get new angles of attack on the problem. Think how many innovations, like James Dyson's bagless vacuum cleaner, how many of those emerged through reframing the problem?
For him, the original problem was that the bag of his old school vacuum cleaner kept getting clogged up with dust. It didn't work very well. His reframe was to ask, why do you need a bag at all? Are there other ways of separating dust from air being sucked through the machine? And of course there are, and he went on to build a very successful business from that idea. And then there's openness. Creativity is all about being open to new ideas, new stimuli, new insights, and the evidence is clear. There are two sides to this openness. The first is around openness as a trait, as part of our personality. That is something we're more or less born with. Traits are relatively stable components of our personality and they shape our behaviours. So the challenge here is to explore ways of developing skills associated with being open, even if our predispositions are not necessarily on the side of openness. The second is around cognitive skills, the ways in which we think. Now, importantly here is this idea of divergent and convergent thinking and its role in creativity. Openness is linked to our ability to think in divergent, explorative fashion. And the challenge here is developing and sharpening our skills in this direction. But we shouldn't forget we do also need that ability to focus in and converge. And then there's willpower. It's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stay with problems longer. Famous quote from Albert Einstein, but he wasn't alone. Many self-descriptions of creators cover the same theme. That's Thomas Edison's 99% perspiration. A hundred years later, Drew Houston, the guy who founded Dropbox, made a similar observation about innovation. It's a very gruelling experience. One day you're on top of the world, the next day there's a huge bug, the sight is down and you're tearing your hair out. And James Dyson didn't magically arrive at his new design for that vacuum cleaner. It evolved over five years of hard work and he had to explore over 5,000 prototypes. Innovators, creators need what Angela Duckworth calls grit. And lastly, at the individual level, self-awareness. Know thyself. Now that was engraved above the entrance of the ancient Greek temple of Delphi, which was the place people went to for insight and knowledge. And in essence, self-awareness is about thinking about thinking. And researchers break this one down into three components. There's the cognitive self, how do we think? The affective self, how do we feel? And the executive self, how do we behave? And it's worth looking at all of these and developing our skills. It's a bit like pausing on a journey and looking down from a hilltop, looking at the map and then the road stretching behind and ahead of us, working out where we are and how we might best move forward. Now, at the group level, we're really interested in what we might call emergent properties. How to ensure that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Now, in principle, more minds on the job can lead to better creativity, in terms of volume and variety of ideas, but only if we get the group dynamics right. Once again, four factors, originally identified by Michael West, Neil Anderson and their colleagues, four factors are important. The first is all about vision, creating and sharing visions, stretching that team towards something more than just a simple solution, and that requires getting them to believe and aspire. Lockheed's famous Skunk Works has become a label for an approach to aiming for and delivering the seemingly impossible. But the Skunk Works and its many derivatives is all about having clear, stretching goals and leaders who can help motivate and focus the team to reach them. But associated with this is the challenge of building psychological safety. The trouble with stretching goals is that reaching them by conventional means isn't always likely to work. We need to take risks, explore new and surprising angles in our creativity, all of which puts our heads well and truly above the parapet. We need the kind of environment which allows us to do so without fearing our heads are going to get shot off. We need this climate of psychological safety. And a key part of that, of course, is a team culture which is all about supporting ideas. 
One of the most influential approaches to mobilising creativity was originally developed by an advertising executive, a man called Alex Osborne, who back in the 1950s developed an approach which he called brainstorming. It was built on a couple of key principles, postpone judgment and build on the ideas of others, what you might call yes and thinking. But it's importantly not about being nice to everyone. Many ideas which emerge aren't strong, but creating the context where they can emerge and then be constructively criticised and explored can build them into something powerful. We don't want a world of nodders, as the humorist P.G. Woodhouse so memorably described in his stories of the emerging movie industry. But what we do want is constructive and supportive challenge. And finally, with that constructive conflict, we need to be prepared to push the frontiers. That's back again to our notion of stretching targets and getting the belief that collectively as a team, we can achieve more. But that depends on taking risks, opening ourselves up to apparently wild ideas, and then choosing and knocking them into shape. Pixar's impressive track record of pushing those creative frontiers in the animated movie world isn't a lucky accident. It's the product of a systematic approach which builds on these principles. So, the individual, the team, but we also need to think of the environment. We've already got plenty to think about in trying to enhance creativity, but we also know that it thrives in certain contexts and withers away in others. So, is it a matter of bean bags and bright colours and a kindergarten spirit, or is it something more structured and systematic? Well, as usual, there's no single thing, but a combination of levers which we can work with. In particular, three elements are important. First, there is something about the physical environment, but it's not just about creating that kindergarten world. It is about finding ways to build helpful features into different workplace contexts. And the good news is there's plenty of useful research here. Going back to things like Tom Allen's pioneering work in the 1970s, looking at the role of physical proximity. Or John Seeley Brown and colleagues understanding the importance of communities of practice, sharing tacit knowledge. Steve Jobs was an early convert to some of this thinking, and his design for the Pixar studios embedded many of those core principles. These days, major companies like BMW, the car maker, commission architects to build creativity into the physical structures so that they enable creative collisions. But there are also structural components. People are the key actors in the creativity equation, so we need to create a context which supports them, sometimes called a creative climate. And components of this weather include reward and recognition systems, the degree of autonomy we allow to individuals, providing time and permission to explore, and the overall approach to creative behaviour. 3M's famous 15% policy effectively signals that the company expects employees to play around, follow their creative instincts for a proportion of time without having to account for it to the company. It's a model which has been widely emulated, and now it's increasingly at the heart of collaboration platforms which try to bring hundreds, sometimes thousands of employees into the collective creativity game. And then there are behavioural components. The idea of an organisation culture is sometimes a little abstract, but in practical terms it comes down to the way we do things around here. In other words, it's the collective values, beliefs and norms which shape the way people behave. So, if we want creativity, then we need to ensure we articulate our key values around things like psychological safety or the potential contribution which ideas coming from anyone, irrespective of status or function, can make. We can reinforce this through leadership, through structural components like those we just mentioned, and certainly by our approach to risk-taking and failure. As William McKnight, one of the pioneer architects of that highly creative culture at 3M, one of the things he's famous for saying, that management that is destructively critical when mistakes are made, kills initiative. And it's essential that we have many people with initiative if we are to continue to grow. So, the recipe for creativity, simple. 
Individual skills, plus the right kind of group dynamics, set in a supportive organisation context. All we need now is a magic wand to bring all that to life. Or failing that, we could use the increasingly rich research base around the topic to work on developing and training the skills which help us build creative workplaces. Thank you.